Hello, saints. I'm Ernette, and this is Zebulun, where truth lives, sharing the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Also known as the three angels' message, found in Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. Today's topic, the great controversy, persecution, in the first centuries, part eight, the second trumpet. So this evening, we're gonna be focused on the second trumpet. Before we proceed, let's have a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us through another week and we enter into your rest, Father God, resting from our works and uh, resting in the finished works of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that the Holy Spirit would come Give us understanding and insight. Give me clarity of thought. Hide me and may your voice be heard from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's jump right into this uh, without a lot of blah, blah. Uh, real quick review. Um, I always like to review things. Uh, we're continuing to study the book, The Great Controversy, and we're almost finished with chapter two. And you'll notice that we've been reading more from the Bible than from the book, The Great Controversy, because The Great Controversy is a lesser light that focuses on the greater light of God's word. And so they're closely aligned. It's just that The Great Controversy gives more detail, but we're, we're going primarily by the scriptures, as, you'll, as you've noticed. Uh, in chapter one, we talked about the fall of Jerusalem and uh, chapter one is aligned with the first epic. And you remember, those of you that have been watching all the videos, the first epic included uh, what time period? It was 300, uh, 30 AD to 100 AD. Um, and the first church, um, Ephesus, covers that period. And then the first seal, which was the white horse, the conquering church, shooting arrows of truth with their bows. And the first trumpet, which was judgment on the enemy of God, which was Jerusalem, who crucified the Savior. And uh, that was the first trumpet and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened in that first epic of time. And in chapter two, the persecution in the first centuries. Um, so but let's go back to chapter one. You'll notice that Ellen White doesn't write about, she didn't really write about um, the white horse or Ephesus, but she wrote about the destruction of Jerusalem. So did she write about, did she write about the first seal, the first, church or the first trumpet? Can you answer that? She wrote about the first trumpet. The first trumpet was the destruction of Jerusalem. And um, then when you get into this chapter two, persecution in the first centuries, um, she's primarily talking about the second seal, which was the red horse, and also the second church, Smyrna, which was persecuted. And um, the second trumpet was um, what we're going to talk about tonight. So I won't say what that is. We're going to study that tonight. Um, and then hopefully, if we have enough time, if not, we'll do it next time. Because I don't believe in rushing. I believe in being very detailed in building what we're building. Because what we're building is a structure of truth based on the word of God, things revealed by God. So in the last days, you'll be able to identify truth and avoid deception. That's what this is all about. And so um, we're also going to touch on chapter three pretty soon. Uh, that's what we're coming up to next. An era of spiritual darkness. And we're going to see the apostasy of the church, of the Christian church, which happened in the period of 313 to 538. This will get into the third church, which is Pergamus, the third horse which is the black horse and the third trumpet, which talks about wormwood. 
But um, let us begin on the second trumpet. Um, why don't I uh, start by reading the second trumpet? So let's go to Revelation chapter 8 and read the second trumpet. The second trumpet here is in pink. And the second angel sounded. What did he sound? He sounded a trumpet. What is a trumpet? It's a warning, usually of warfare. The trumpets, remember, they're a military cycle. And it shows how God fights for his church. When you, when you mess with God's church, God is going to mess with you. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. God keeps stock when people abuse his saints and his church. And so um, what goes around comes around. And, and you reap what you sow when you mess with God's people. And we're going to see that very clearly in the second trumpet. And even more so in the third trumpet. Anyway, the second angel sounded, sounded his trumpet. As it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of ships were destroyed. Okay? This is, is this, does this sound literal or symbolic? Yeah, it sounds symbolic for the sea to turn to blood and the second angel sounding his trumpet, um, a burning mountain, a mountain burning and cast into the sea. This is uh, obviously symbolic. And so we need to look to the Bible for what do these symbols mean? So let's go back to our outline here and uh, let me make it a little bigger. And so it's obviously symbolic. Let me bring out my uh, laser pointer. It's obviously symbolic. So we need to know what does the symbols mean? That's the key to interpreting Revelation. Remember when we studied Revelation 1? It said uh, that Revelation was signified by, the, by, by God unto the servant John. Signified means it's in sign language. And uh, so what is a mountain? A mountain represents kingdoms in the Bible. And I'm going to give you scriptures, of course. Um, I'm not going to turn there, but if you remember in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar saw a, a statue. And do you remember what that statue was had? It had a head of gold. It had arms of silver, a belly of brass, and legs of iron. And um it was hit by a stone and, and feet of iron and clay and a stone made without hands made without hands means god made it a stone was sent and that stone was christ and it hit the statue broke it into powder and that stone became a mountain that enveloped the whole earth so that mountain represents the kingdom of christ in the new earth the new Jerusalem in the earth. Okay, so that's that's what a kingdom represents. That's what a mountain represents, a kingdom. And let's look at a few more scriptures. Isaiah 14 and verse 3. Let's turn there. Isaiah 14 and verse 3. Isaiah 14 and verse 3. I'm going to be moving swiftly, so you can screenshot, take a picture of some of these scriptures. So you can have them to look up later. This is talking about Lucifer, Satan, his fall from heaven. And uh, we're going to focus on the mountain. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God, those are the angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So he wants to sit on the mount of the congregation. What does mount mean? Mount is short for what? Mountain. The mountain of the congregation. That's Mount Zion where God sits. He's the true king of the north. 
the Satan, Satan wants to be the king of the north. And he, he's going to sit on the mount of the congregation. So, so the kingdom of God, once again, like in Daniel 2, is a great mountain. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Okay. And let's consider some other verses here. Um, Psalms 48. Psalms 48. What book did I say? Psalms 48, verse 1. And uh, as we look into God's word, let's say a brief little prayer, prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, as we approach your word, we do it reverently. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to give us insight and understanding, not of, not of a, a personal understanding, but of your understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Or not a private understanding. Okay, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of his holiness. So see in Hebrew, well, well, no, actually, yeah, this is Hebrew. In Hebrew, this is like parallelism. When they say in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, they're, they're uh, synonymous. So the mountain is like a, the city of God. And the city of God, the New Jerusalem, it's humongous. It's like 1,500 miles cube. So uh, it's more like a country or a nation. And so this mountain is the city of God. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is what? Mount Zion on the sides of the north. That's where the table of showbread is. Remember, we're putting it all together. The city of the great king, or it could be, say, the nation of the great king. So we're, we're focused on that a, a mountain represents a nation. Let's look at a couple more scriptures. Uh, Revelation 17, 9 and 10. Revelation 17, 9 and 10. Revelation 17, 9 and 10. Here we go. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads. So this is talking about the beast. And the whore, a whore is riding a beast, and the beast has seven heads. And the seven heads are what? Seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. So these seven kings are kings over the seven mountains. So the seven mountains must be kingdoms. Okay, so these are seven kingdoms. And it's, it's uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Papal Rome, and uh, uh, it falls, and then it reestablishes itself again after its deadly wound heals. So these are kingdoms. Um, okay, so we'll go to our next scripture. Um, let's look at Jeremiah, verse 50. Jeremiah 50 and 51 are packed with information about this. So it's a great mountain. Now, this mountain is, let's look at Revelation 8 real quick. This great mountain and the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain, it was what? Burning with fire. And it was cast where? Into the sea. So you have a mountain, which is a nation. What does it mean that it's burning with fire? And then it's cast into the sea. Does that sound like a good thing or a bad thing? Sound like a bad thing. And we're going to look in Jeremiah 50 and 51 and get a little more details of to what does that mean. Jeremiah is talking about the same thing. You'll see the same verbiage, Jeremiah 50. Just remember these elements. Uh, a great mountain is burning with fire and is cast into the sea. Okay. All right, we're going to jump. You, you, you should read this whole chapter because what we're talking about uh, 
is the judgment of a nation. The mountain is a nation. And this, in this case, it's basically Babylon. And Jeremiah 50 is all about, and 51 also, is all about the judgment of Babylon. So you could read the whole thing if you want on your own time, but we just don't have time to read all of it. So I'm going to just read some of the key verses. Uh, verse 3, for out of the north, see, Babylon is the, is the king of the north. Now, you might say, you just said Satan wants to be the king of the north. Yes, Satan wants to be the king of the north. Who's the real king of the north? God, because he sits on the table of showbread on his throne over the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. But Satan wants to sit there. And how does Satan want to sit there? He works through uh, kingdoms and powers in this world to accomplish that. He worked through Herod to try to kill Jesus. He works through um, other powers. He worked through Babylon to destroy God's people. So he works through the Assyrians. He works through kingdoms to accomplish his goals. For out of the north cometh up a nation against her. Who is her? Her is a woman. It's Israel. It's God's church. And this is Babylon coming against Israel, which shall make her land desolate and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her. Okay? And God is going to judge Babylon for coming against his people. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations. So see, God used Babylon to punish Israel because of their sins, but then he's going to punish Babylon for what they did to Israel. Because like I said, what goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. And so, um, for lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set, that's where Medo-Persia came from. They came and um, conquered Babylon. And they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. And Chaldea is another name for Babylon. The Chaldeans shall be a spoil. All that spoil her shall be satisfied, saith the Lord. So the Lord is going to spoil Babylon. Let's go down further. We're going to put this all together in a minute. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the north. Many what? Many kings, not just one. Remember that. It's going to be a multitude of kings that are going to bring down Babylon. And they shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel. They are cruel. You need to remember that. And will not show mercy. See these, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and give you a little clue. Th this Babylon is talking about Rome. I'm going to show you that in a minute. And Rome was destroyed by many nations, the, the, the Ostrogoths, the Van, the, the, the Goths, the um, uh, Vandals, uh, and they were cruel. They were merciless. The, um, the Huns, these were all the nations of Europe that brought Rome to its demise. Um, Therefore shall roar like the what? Like the sea. Remember we talked about the sea, a great mountain was cast into the sea and they shall ride upon horses, every one put in array like a man to the battle against the O daughter of Babylon. So these are judgments against Babylon. And we're going to jump over to verse 51, chapter 51 and the utter destruction of Babylon and Babylon. We're going to see through the ages is going to be referring to pagan Rome and papal Rome in the end times. The God calls it in book of Revelation, Babylon, because we're going to study in our next session, we're going to see a connection between Babylon, Pergama, pagan Rome, and papal Rome through this religion called Mithraism. But uh, we'll study that next time.
Let's go down here. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea. Here's that parallelism. So Babylon and Chaldea means the same thing. If you're a Chaldean, you're a Babylonian. And their evil that they have done to who? In Zion. So why is God punishing Babylon? Because of the evil that they did to Zion. Who is Zion? Mount Zion, the mountain or the nation of God. Saith the Lord, behold, I am against the old, look what he's calling Babylon. Oh, destroying what? Mountain. So he's calling Babylon a mountain. Saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee a burnt mountain. So what kind of a mountain? A burnt mountain. So the mountain burning with fire, it's representing Babylon being judged by God. And as we saw in verse chapter 4, 50, it was uh, the cast into the sea in the sense that the nations of Europe, the barbarians, the um, Ostrogoths, the Goths, the um, Hurali, the, the Huns, the Vandals, those peoples attacked the borders of Rome and brought it and attacked the um, trade routes and brought Rome down. Um, so that's the same language that we see in, um, Revelation 8. So let's go back to our notes. So we can see a mountain is a kingdom. It could be the kingdom of God. It could be Babylon. These are the two main mountains, Mount Zion and Babylon in the great controversy. Okay. Um, the wicked cities come under the king under Babylon. The the false religions come under Babylon, and then the true religion is, comes under uh, Mount Zion. Uh, let's see, where was I? Isaiah seven mountains, Jeremiah fifty one. Okay, so let's just read what I wrote here. Uh, let's make it larger. I'm trying to not rush too much. My mom used to always tell me, take take your time, but hurry. So that's what I'm going to do. The second tr trumpet is describing the destruction of Babylon, but it's in the person of Rome because by this time, whoops, by this time, remember, we're, we're in the time period of what? The second trumpet is from 100 AD, um, no, no, yeah, to 313 AD, the second trumpet, okay? Now, Babylon was destroyed a long time before that. Nebuchadnezzar and all that, they were destroyed by the, by the um, Medes and the Persians a long time ago. So who is living now that is representing Babylon? It's Rome. And so, um, uh, like I said, next week we're going to see the connection between um, Babylon Pergama, pagan Rome, and papal Rome through Mithraism. But that's in the third epic, which is 313 to 538. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But it covers the transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. But my point is here that when it talks about Babylon, it's really talking about Rome. Watch this. I'm going to show you in the Bible. 1 Peter 513. Let's read this, 1 Peter 5, 13. 1 Peter 5. Now, verse 13. Now, the, 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 um, this is, 1 Peter was written by who? Peter. Where was Peter when he wrote 1 Peter? If you do a little research, you'll find out Peter is in Rome writing to the churches in Asia Minor. If you have a Bible that describes the, the background of the book, just read that. And it'll tell you Peter was in Rome and he was writing to the churches in Asia Minor. And look what he says. This is at the end. See, see chapter five is the end of, of Peter's five books. And so he's giving a final greeting. It should be a final farewell. I don't know why they say greeting. Greetings in the beginning. This is a final farewell. And look what he says. 
the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so does Marcus, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So he's saying the church is, that is where? In Babylon. But Babylon is not even in existence anymore. But see, Babylon was a code word for Rome, even in Peter's day. And so Peter is saying, you know, the church that is in Babylon salutes you. He's, he's basically saying the church that is in Rome. So Rome and Babylon are synonymous. Uh, this is why papal Rome in the book of Revelation is referred to as Babylon. First Peter 5.13, I already read that. Okay, so let's take a look back at our text, our anchor text, Revelation 8, and make sure we keep track where we're going. Make it clear. And the second angel sounded his trumpet, as it were, a great mountain or a nation burning with fire, being judged by God, was cast into the sea. So we need to see what does the sea represent now? And the third part of the sea became blood. Blood, this is not the blood of Jesus. This is the blood of death. And so we need to see what is the sea. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. We need to see what these creatures are that are in the sea. And the third part of ships were destroyed. We need to see what these things mean. So let's go and and look at them symbol by symbol. So first of all, creatures. Let's look at what are creatures. Creatures in the sea. At first glance, what does it make you think of? Creatures of the sea, you think of fish, octopus, whales, porpoises, crabs, um, tuna. You know, you think of fish. But let's see what, what it re actually represents. Creatures. Creatures. You might think of animals, but watch this. Colossians 1.23. Colossians, what book did I say? Colossians 1.23. Colossians 1, verse 23. Watch what creatures are. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached. So the gospel was preached to who? Every creature which is under heaven. Wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister. So creatures represents who? People, human beings, who the gospel is preached to. You don't preach the gospel to a fish. You don't preach the gospel to a dolphin. You don't preach the gospel to a tuna. They don't know what you're talking about. You preach the gospel to creatures, people, okay? So creatures can be people in the Bible. Let's read Mark 16, 15. Mark 16, 15. Let's see, Matthew, Mark. Mark, what did I say, 16, 15? And he said, this is the Great Commission. This is Jesus speaking. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to who? to every creature. What is creature? Creatures is peoples. Okay. Okay. So creatures is people. Let me just write that there. People. Whoops. Whoops. What does the C represent? It should be starting to come together for you. What does the sea represent? Well, let's look at Jeremiah 51, verse 42. Jeremiah, we remember we just came from 50 and 51 of Jeremiah. What's Jeremiah 50 and 51 about? Somebody. That's right. The judgment of Babylon. So we're going to look back at that verse. I told you it's packed. You should just read the whole thing, 50 and 51. We're going to read Jeremiah 51, 42 now. Jeremiah 51, 42. Jeremiah. Old Testament, Jeremiah 51, 42. It's a big book, 51, 
and verse 42. I'll just scroll down to verse 42. And we want to, um, we're trying to understand what the sea represents, okay? The sea is come upon, come up upon Babylon. So the she is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. So here you see, whatever the sea is, this is not really telling us what the sea is, but whatever the sea is, is coming on Babylon. It's coming on Rome. We're going to see in a minute, the sea is multitudes of people. So like I said, what brought Rome down? Rome wasn't conquered by one country. Rome was conquered by a multitude of barbarians. Like I said, the Visigoths, the uh, Ostrogoths, the Goths, the Huns, the Vandals, the Hurli, they all attacked Rome relentlessly and brought her down. So a multitude of waves of people, wave after wave of people attacking Rome. But this doesn't say people, but we're not done yet. Let's keep going. Okay. So that was I, Jeremiah. Let's look at Isaiah 17, 12. Isaiah 17, 12. Isaiah 17, 12. We're letting the Bible identify these symbols. It's not what I say. It's not what you say. It's not what your pastor says. It's what does the Bible say. My motto is, if it's not in the word, it doesn't deserve to be heard. 17, 12. Woe to the multitude of many what? Many people. Woe to the multitude of many people. Whoops, I didn't mean to highlight all of that. Well, that's okay. Which make a noise like what? The noise of the seas. So here's that parallelism. So seas represents many people. And to the rushing of what? Nations. That make a rushing like the rushing of mighty what? Waters. So the seas represent people, waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters. So you see there, nations represented by waters, but God shall rebuke them and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at even tide, even, evening tide, trouble, and before the morning, he is not. This is a portion of them that spoil us. Okay. So I didn't need to I didn't need to highlight all those verses. So anyway, you see the sea represents multitudes of people. Is that clear, brothers and sisters? Let's keep going. Um, so we have um, let's just keep going. Let's just put all these symbols together. So we have this creatures as people, the sea is a multitudes of peoples. The mountains, a nation, burning mountain is nation being judged. Okay, we're, we're starting to see a picture here. Now, what is a fish? Well, if the sea is multitudes of people, what do you think a single fish is? Those are what? People, individuals. Let's see. Let's see what the Bible says. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 14. Habakkuk. Let's say two or three or one. Yeah, one in verse 14. Now, what's the title? The, the Lord's answer, Habakkuk's complaint. So Habakkuk's complaining, the Lord's giving an answer. Habakkuk's second complaint. And make us men as the what? Fishes of the sea. Is that clear? So what is this telling us? make us men as fishes of the sea. So when you see fish, it's talking about men. It's not talking about fish. Of the sea, the sea is the multitudes of the people of the earth as the creeping things that have not, no ruler over them. Those are the creatures. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net. 
What is the net that catches fish? The net is the gospel. I'm casting a net right now. I'm fishing for men. I'm trying to catch men for Christ into the sea. I'm putting it on YouTube out in the sea to catch some fish in the net of the three angels message and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. See these fish, if you get caught, you're glad. So let's go back. And uh, that's Habakkuk 14 and 15. Let's look at Ecclesiastes. So fish are what? People. Ecclesiastes 9, 12. I'm going to give you more than one verse to nail at home. Ecclesiastes 9, and I think I said verse 12. Yeah, watch this. For man also knoweth not his time. You, you, you don't know when you're going to die. It could be tomorrow. It could be tonight. It could be when Christ comes and you might be translated without seeing death. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in a snare, so are the sons of men. So here's parallelism again in Hebrew poetry. If they say that um, fish taken in a net, so are, that means that's like sons of men snared in an evil time. So the fish are men when it falleth suddenly upon them, okay? We're just establishing that fish are men. Uh, let's look at two more. Ezekiel 29, 3 and 4. Ezekiel 29, 3 and 4. Ezekiel 29, powerful book, 3 and 4. Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. But I will put hooks in thy jaw, and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales. So he's a fish because he's, he's putting a hook in Pharaoh's jaw. That's how you catch fish. And, and his people. When the, seven, when the ten plagues hit Egypt, he was putting a hook in the mouth of Pharaoh and his people, at least all of those who didn't uh, follow Moses. And all the fish of thy river shall stick unto thy scales. So once again, you see Pharaoh and his people are referred to as fish. And our last verse here, Matthew 4, 19. I'm going to turn there, but you know this scripture. This is Jesus speaking, Matthew 4, 19. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of fish? Fishers of tuna? Fishers of halibut? No, fishers of men. So fish are men. So now, There's one more phrase in there. Let's look at Revelation 8 again. We have it all together now. We're going to put all to get all of it together. Revelation 8. But there's one more there's one more symbol in here. And the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and a third part of the sea became blood and a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. What does it mean and had life? And, and and the ones that had life, they did what? They died. I thought every living creature had life. Well, here, Jesus is differentiating. Um, th there's some creatures that had life and some that didn't. And their third part of the ships were destroyed. So we need to see what does had life mean and what are these ships. Then we're going to put it all together, okay? Well, what does it mean, had life? Let's look at that. They had the bread of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ that teaches salvation unto eternal life is the bread of life. 
Um, so if you have Jesus, you have life. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. You're, you're dead. Let's look at what the Bible says. Luke 9, verse 60. Luke 9, verse 60. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 9 and verse 60. Wow, that's a lot of verses. All the way down, verse 60. I didn't highlight it. Let me highlight it now. Jesus speaking. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. He's saying, go preach the gospel. Because see, um, okay, Jesus was asking this guy to follow him. And the guy said, I'll follow you, but first, uh, suffer me first to go bury my father. And so Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. So who's burying this guy's father? He's telling him, don't go to the funeral. You need to follow me right now. Now, who's burying the dead? The dead is his father. And the people burying his father are also called dead. You know why? Because they're unbelievers. In Jesus' eyes, if you're an unbeliever, even though you're walking around, you're dead because you're going to die the second death. And conversely, if you're a believer, even if you die, you're not dead. You're merely asleep. Remember Lazarus? He told him, Lazarus is asleep. He's not dead. If I die tomorrow, I'm not dead. I'm asleep. Until the trump of God, I'm going to wake back up in the first resurrection by the grace of God. Okay, so the saints, they die when they're born again. When you're born again, you die of self. You're baptized, you go down in a watery grave, and you're born again. You don't die anymore. And uh, you might go to sleep, and then the next thing you know is a resurrection. But the wicked, um, they're dead. So in, in Revelation 8, when it says, the fish that had life... It's talking about believers, men and women that are believers, that had life. But what happened to them? They had life, but then they died. We're going to see what that means. We're going to see what that means. The Bible is good. Let's look at John 5.12. Is it 1 John 5.12 or John 5.12? 1 John 5.12, okay, it's a big difference. 1 John 5.12, here's 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12. He that hath the, see how we're putting scriptures together? This is how you study the Bible. This is how you make sure to understand what God's will is. He that hath the Son hath what? Hath life. If you have the Son, you have life eternal life and he that hath not the son hath not life if you don't have jesus you don't have life and if you do have jesus you do have life okay so the fish that had life are what believers but the fish that don't have life are lost So let's go back to our verse. Well, before we go back to our verse, there's one more part, a third. It keeps talking about a third. Now, we studied this already. A third in Revelation. I'm not going to turn there, but if you turn to Revelation 12, you see the fall of Satan from heaven when he was cast out of heaven. And a third of the angels were, cat, were drawn by his tail. And we talked about a tail represents telling tales or lies and deceiving people. He deceived a third of the angels. So so when you when it talks about a third, that's a symbol for deception. Somebody being deceived with false doctrine. Okay? And so let's put it all together. Let's put it all together. Revelation 8. And we'll see what God is trying to tell us here. Okay? And the second angel sounded his trumpet with a military warning, as it were, a great mountain, that's a nation, Rome, 
Babylon, which in this case is epitomized or uh, by Rome or personified by Rome. And it was burning, it's being judged by God. Why? Because see, who, who, who crucified Christ? Two people crucified Christ. Two nations conspired to crucify Christ. Who were they? The nation of Israel. And in the first trumpet, Israel was judged with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD during the 30 to 100 AD time period. See that? So what you reap, you sow. You kill Christ and Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Jesus warned them that it's going to be not one stone left upon another. Remember Matthew 24? We studied that in detail. So God judged Israel. So now who else killed Jesus? It wasn't Israel by itself. Who helped them? Rome which is Babylon. And so Rome, in the second trumpet, Rome is being judged, okay? And um, Rome is this great mountain burning with fire, being judged, and was cast into the sea, the multitudes of the people. And the third part of the sea became blood. There was a lot of death. A lot of people died during this time. Uh, and a third, verse nine, and a third part of the creatures, creatures are what? People, which were in the sea and had life. Who has life? Believers. But look what happened to them. They died. What does that mean? They had life, but they died. Well, a third part means what? Deception. Of, so a third of the people were deceived and went from having life to dying. They apostatized. This is talking about apostasy under Rome. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, the ships is the only thing we didn't describe, but think about it. If the seas represent the multitudes of people and the fish represent individuals, what does a ship represent? Well, Let's go look at that. A third of the ships were destroyed. Okay. This represents, the third means deceptions. They were destroyed by deception, by lies. I'm going to tell you right out. Churches, or uh, ships represent associations of people. When fish all get together, it's a ship. When people all come together, it's represented as a ship. A fish represents one person. A ship represents a group. It could be a church. Usually it's a church or a, a business uh, association, business entities, associations of people selling merchandise. Even the church sells merchandise. What merchandise does a church sell? It sells the gospel. It sells eternal life. It sells a relationship with Christ. That's what I'm selling right now. I hope you're buying it. And um, they're trading upon the seas. The ships are trading upon the seas. Um, but it's also not just churches, business entities. Um, Amazon is a ship. Pfizer is a ship. AstraZeneca is a ship. Facebook is a ship. Trade, trading on the seas commercially. Let's read Matthew 4.19. Matthew 4.19. Matthew 4.19. And um, then we'll bring this on to a close. And he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Okay, we read that already. Let's keep going. Let's keep it moving. Um, First Timothy one nineteen. First Timothy one nineteen. We're trying to see what ships are. First Timothy one nineteen. I'm going to go faster. You can always pause your video. Holding faith 
and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. So this is believers and they lose their faith and what kind, what happens? They become shipwrecked, okay? Uh, let's keep going. Um, we're gonna put these together. Uh, where was I? Hebrews 619, Hebrews 619, Hebrews 619. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Okay, once again, you have a your shipwreck, an anchor. These are ships referring to God's people. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, Revelation 18, 17, and 18. Revelation 18, 17. Revelation 18, 17. Okay, this is symbolic. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. Who's rich in Revelation 17? I mean 18. It's Babylon. Babylon is amassing great wealth, even as I speak. And Babylon has all the corporations in her pocket. Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Facebook, Amazon, Walmart, you name it. They have them in their pocket. For in one hour, so great riches is come to naught. It's all going to come to naught. It's all going to come crashing down. And every shipmaster and all the company in ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. All these companies are going to be watching the destruction of Babylon. And they're going to be saying, wow, she made us rich, but now look at her. Uh, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning and saying, what city is like this unto, unto this great city? So this is Babylon's final destruction. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, that's all I want to read right there. Let's keep going. Let's keep it moving. Keep it moving. Where was I? Okay, let's read Proverbs. Oops, that should be an R there. Let me put an R. 31, 1 and 14. Proverbs 31, 1. Proverbs 31. Proverbs. Where's Proverbs? 31. Last book of Proverbs, 31.1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Okay, P Proverbs 31 is a what? It's a prophecy, a prophecy for end times. So let's read it. Now, prophecy, um, it's talking about women. It's going to talk about a, a whore woman, and then it's going to talk about a righteous woman. Who do you think these women represent? The women represent churches. The, the whore is Babylon, and the righteous woman is the woman of Revelation 12, who has standing on the moon with the sun above her and 12 stars. Okay, that's the, the God's people. Okay, so when he describes the righteous woman, the woman who fears the Lord, she is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. Okay, so this is merchandise. Okay, on the ship. So the, the woman is the, is the church. So the ch the ship is a group of people associating together in the name of Christ, or in other words, the church. She perceiveth that her merchandise is what good. God is good. Everything God made was good in Genesis. He made the first day, the second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, it was good. And the seventh day, he said it was very good. Okay, so everything God makes is good. His church, everything she, her merchandise is good. It's the gospel. It's good news. Okay, so she is a merchant and her merchandise is the gospel. But the devil's merchandise is just money. The root of evil is that the, the love of money is the root of all evil. 
So that's a uh, uh, verse eight, 14 and 18. I didn't read 14, did I? And 18, I did. Okay, good. All right. All right. All right. Just making sure, just checking myself, check myself. My students used to tell me, uh, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And I said, okay, I'll check myself before I wreck myself. Corrupt woman versus virtuous woman. Okay, we read that. And you, if you read one to nine, you're going to see the strange woman, she gives wine and makes Lemuel, tries to make King Lemuel drunk. And that's the wine of Babylon. In Revelation, the woman has a golden cup and the wine of Babylon that makes people drunk and stumble at the commandments of God and say stupid things like, we don't have to obey the commandments of God. We live under grace. Uh, Ezra. But the righteous woman, she brings, uh, the virtuous woman brings nourishment, food, bread, life. We're breaking bread right now. This word of God is bread. Ezra 27, 9. Ezra 27. Is that Ezra? No, that's Ezekiel. Ezekiel 27. I told you Ezekiel is powerful. Ezekiel 27. Where is Ezekiel? Right there. Ezekiel 27. Verse 9. The ancients of Gibel and the wise men thereof were in the, thy caulkers. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in thee to occupy thy merchandise. So the merchants of the world are ships. And uh, was there another verse? There was, let's see. Verse nine, Ezekiel nine, 25 and 29, 25 and 29. I didn't highlight them. Let's see, 25. Look at that. The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou was replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas okay and uh what's the other verse 29 and all they that handle the oar who handles the oar mariners and all the pilots of the sea shall come down from their ships they shall stand upon the land. Okay. Okay. So now, um, it's very interesting. Pfizer and AstraZeneca, these two groups, these are ships that are being, that are merchants and uh, Babylon is making them rich. I don't remember the exact amount, but Pfizer last year in 2021, they made like $9 billion, maybe more. I, I don't remember the exact amount, but it was a lot, huge amount, an, an ungodly amount. And um, Revelation 18.18, 18, Pfizer is a pharmaceutical company. They're the ones pushing the vaccine that they're trying to mandate everyone in the world to take. That's a lot of money. AstraZeneca too. Now watch this, Revelation 18, 18. This is just a side note. Revelation 18, 18. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and us may as trade by sea stood afar off. So these are all the companies uh, Pfizer is going to be standing there looking at the fall of Babylon and cried when they saw the smoke of the burning saying, what city is like this great city? Because they had and cried weeping. No, that's not the verse I wanted. Let me see. That's part of it, but there's more. There's another verse. Um, Revelation 9, 21. Watch this. Revelation 9, 21. I'll read 20 and 21. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, this is talking about the seven last plagues. They they didn't repent because probation is closed. So they're not going to repent of their works, of their hands. 
that they should not worship devils. They're worshiping, worshiping the devil and idols of gold and silver. They're chasing the almighty dollar and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Their idol is money. Neither repented they of their murderers or of their sorceries. This word sorceries, watch this. I'm going to put this in, uh, let me see, what verse was that? Oh, shoot. Verse 21, the last verse. Okay, that's easy to find. Now watch this. This word for sorceries is um, 5331 in Greek in the Strong's Concordance. And look what it says. It's pharmakia, which means medication. So that's a direct reference to Pfizer and AstraZeneca and these other co uh, pharmaceutical companies that are pharmakia. They're making medication in this vaccine and they're trying to mandate it. Up in Canada, the truckers are saying enough is enough. And Trudeau is just trying to force them. His only answer is vaccine, 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 take the vaccine. And these pharmaceutical companies are becoming rich. And these sorceries of these um, uh, people uh, are um, um, are pharmaceuticals. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. They're stealing from the people. They're stealing money from us. And what is the fornication? They're having intercourse with the beast instead of with Christ. God wants us to be his bride, but they're going with the beast. They're going with Babylon. They're having inter they're intercoursing with the whore of Babylon. So anyway, let's bring this to a close, people. So um, this is the judgment of the second enemy of Israel, Rome or Babylon. As Rome declines, pagan Rome ascends, and with it, apostasy ascends. Compromise begins here and will continue into the next epics let's let's make this slider larger and let's move this up here the next epic we're going to look at in chapter three is going to cover um the dark ages now the dark ages covers epic three four five and six all of them are going to be under the roman catholic church during the dark ages or babylon Papal Rome or Babylon. So Israel has fallen and was replaced by pagan Rome. So Israel was judged. Then pagan Rome in the second, in the first trumpet, Israel was judged. In the second trumpet, Rome is judged. And in the, um, it's going to be replaced by papal Rome. And Satan is working behind all these powers. Um, so let's tie it all together. Second Thessalonians 2 as we close. Second Thessalonians 2. Now this is Apostle Paul. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither in spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as to the day of Christ is at hand. So see, they were beginning to think in Thessalonica that Christ was coming in their generation. And Paul is saying, no, 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 don't. Don't let our letters make you think that because let no man deceive you by any means for that day, the day of Christ's second coming shall not come except there come what? A falling away first. A falling away of the quote unquote Christian church into apostasy and that man of sin be revealed. The Pope, I can tell you right now, the son of perdition. That's the nickname that they gave Judas, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember when I was with you, I told you these things? 
And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. So in Paul's lifetime, he's saying Rome is already, the Roman Empire, where Paul, Paul was crucified under Nero during the Roman, during the, the, the um, persecution in the first century. And only he who now let it, that's Rome, un, will let until he be taken out of the way. So pagan Rome is going to be taken out of the way and papal Rome is going to replace it. Pagan Rome is going to be taken out of the way. It's the burning mountain in, in the second trumpet. And in the third trumpet, you're going to see apostasy is going to replace pagan Rome in the form of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they call it the Roman Catholic Church. And we're going to look at some of that when we get into the third trumpet. So, um, I'm going to read some of these sections from the Great Controversy next time, but uh, we don't have time tonight. So, um, let's end with prayer, and we'll pick it up and read some chapters of the Great Controversy, and then we'll go into the third epic next time. Loving Father, we thank you. We covered a lot tonight, and I pray that the saints can take notes and study these things out, whether they be true. And if they're true, that they would follow them, Father God. We thank you for your word and your wisdom and how you teach us. Uh, may we absorb knowledge and truth so that we can avoid error and avoid deception in these last days. And we pray that you would watch us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, my brothers and sisters. See you next time.